If I say to you, do you have difficulty paying attention, get bored easily, have poor impulse control, and difficulty sitting still, what would you say? Yes. Okay. And then I say, why do you have those symptoms? You would say, because I have ADHD. I was told. And then I'd say, how do you know you have ADHD? Because I have difficulty sitting still, paying attention, et cetera. Racing thoughts, yeah. But why do I have racing thoughts and have difficulty paying attention? Because I have ADHD. How do we know you got ADHD? Because I have racing thoughts and difficulty sitting still. You haven't explained a thing. You know, That's so fascinating. It's not an explanation. It's a description. Welcome to Successful with ADHD. I'm Brooke Schnittman, and if you have ADHD and are feeling overwhelmed, chaotic, and negative self-beliefs, you're in the right place. The Successful with ADHD podcast shares my guests' journeys of overcoming challenges, offering their tips and strategies for success to empower you to take control of your life and thrive with ADHD. Let's get started. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the Successful with ADHD. I have Gabor Mate, and a lot of you who follow me know him very well. If you know anything about addiction, stress, ADHD, childhood development, uh, Dr. Gabor Mate is highly sought out after his expertise on a range of topics. He's written several best-selling books, including the New York Times bestseller, The Myth of Normal, The Award-Winning Realm of Hungry Ghosts, uh, Close Encounters with Addiction, When the Body Says No, The Cost of Hidden Stress, and Scattered Minds, The Origins and Healing of Attention Deficit Disorder, which I can't believe I haven't read it until now, but of course I was looking through notes. It was on there, but ADHD brain never got around to it. And he is the co-author of Hold On To Your Kids, Why Parents Need to Matter More Than Peers. So his work have been published in internationally in more than 30 languages, which is so amazing. Welcome. Thank you. Nice to be with you. Very nice to have you here. Um, did I miss anything? No, uh, only to say that, um, you know, I, I trained as a medical doctor, worked as a family physician, worked in family practice um, in palliative care, and then for 12 years with a heavy, heavily drug addicted population here in Vancouver. I myself um, was first self diagnosed and then diagnosed with ADHD in my early 50s. And very quickly, I came to the conclusion that the usual explanation of ADHD just didn't wash. And so that's when I wrote my first book, which was The Scattered Minds that you just read. Absolutely. So you were self-diagnosed. What gave you that idea that initially, before you got a medical diagnosis, that you, in fact, might have it? Well, most adults, I think, come to it but kind of self-recognition. So I was working as the medical coordinator, coordinator of the palliative care unit at the Vancouver Hospital, looking after terminally ill people, in, in addition to my family practice. And the social worker in the unit, whose name was Betsy Jo Spicer, came to me one day and says, hey, can we have coffee? And I said, yeah. And, and she told me she'd just been diagnosed and, and with ADHD. And she told me all the symptoms, you know, they had poor impulse control, the difficulty paying attention, easily being bored, restlessness, and so on. I said, yeah, this is me. And she says, yeah, I know. That's why I wanted to have coffee with you. <laughs> but she didn't come out and tell you, but she insinuated that, yeah. Well, yeah <laughs> basically. And um, so within five minutes, I got it. I didn't know anything about the condition. Uh, most doctors don't, still don't. Didn't then, don't now. Really? Then I just immersed myself into the ADHD literature. And as much as I... I appreciated the diagnosis as kind of a framework for for my life of why I behaved in certain ways and functioned in certain ways or dysfunctioned in certain ways. At the same time, the medical explanation of this is a genetic brain disease just never made any sense to me. And so I started off with that. I did get finally, you know, not typically, as I described in Scattered Minds, as you read, the typical impulse control or the lack of it. The first day I heard about ADHD, I self-medicated. Which most people do, right? Don't try this at home, folks, but because I was a doctor. <laughs> I, Disclaimer. I, I went to one of my friends and said, hey, Bev, I think I've got ADHD. Can you give me some Ritalin? And she says, sure, how much do you want? And typically, under the principle that if a little bit of Ritalin is good, then more is even better, 
I took a high then recommended initial dose. And as I described in the book, I really felt present and focused. And I went home and my wife said, you look stoned. And uh, <laughs> and within a couple of days, the really, really made me depressed. Mm. So, which is one of its potential side effects. I mean, not on everybody, mm. but that sort of, every brain is different. Right. I did go see a psychiatrist. She did confirm the diagnosis and prescribed dextrine. Uh-huh which helped me for a while. And, and, and I took it while I wrote my first book. It was very mm-hmm. helpful. Dextrodine, as I pointed out in Scarlet Mites, made me a much more efficient workaholic, you know, and I could... <laughs> not Another could, addiction. <laughs> yeah, <it was> <laughs> and I could pursue my addiction to work even more diligently, you know. But it did help me write my first book. Then I immersed myself in the scientific literature and truly the idea that this is a genetic disease is scientific nonsense. And I don't care how many times people repeat it, they just haven't looked at the evidence. And, you know, since the publication of the book, I've had, you know, I don't know how many hundreds or thousands of people telling me that I changed their lives. They understand themselves yeah. better now. The book was published internationally in all kinds of languages. Um, and so I'm more convinced than I was then, because more information has come out not to support it, that ADHD is A, not a disease, and B, it's not inherited, and uh, sure, it doesn't have to define you. And and it doesn't like you said in the book, you're not ADHD. ADHD, you have ADHD. Well, you know what? I don't even say that anymore. Oh, okay. <laughs> what do you say now? Well, here's the thing. Like, um, I have a wallet. Okay, so here's my wallet. I can pick it up. I can put it down. I can give it away. The qualities and uh, characteristics of the wallet doesn't depend on me. It's totally separate from me. I have it. There's an entity called I. There's an entity called Gabor. Like there's an entity called Brooke. Then there's an entity called a wallet. And this entity, Gabor, has this particular wallet. But it's no part of me. Mm. Now... When I say I have ADHD, or if I say I have multiple sclerosis, or if I say I have depression, I'm making an assumption, which is that there's an I, an entity called Gabor, and an entity called ADHD that I have that's got its own characteristics and its own life separate from me. Number one. Number two. Although when I was first diagnosed, the when I first wrote the book, I thought, well, this explains how I am, it actually doesn't explain anything. Because if I say to you, do you have difficulty paying attention, get bored easily, have poor impulse control, and difficulty sitting still, what would you say? Yes. Okay. And then I say, why do you have those symptoms? You would say, because I have ADHD. I was told. And then I'd say, how do you know you have ADHD? Because I have difficulty sitting still, paying attention, et cetera. Racing thoughts, yeah. But why do I have racing thoughts and have difficulty paying attention? Because I have ADHD. How do we know you got ADHD? Because I have racing thoughts and difficulty sitting still. You haven't explained a thing. You know, it's so fascinating. It's not an explanation. It's a description. Wow. It describes how my mind works, differences and similarities, but it describes in some measure how your mind works. Yeah. But it doesn't explain it. Right. The, the explanation is circular. So there's two points to be made. It's not that there's a thing called ADHD that I have. Is that there's a process in my nervous system and my body that is characterized by certain features. Where does that process come from? And is it separate from me? And if I change that process, which I know I can do, all of a sudden I function differently. So what you is talk it? a lot about automatic nervous system in the book. Yeah. Definitely ADHD refers to the functioning of our minds and our brains and our nervous system. But that doesn't mean that it's a separate entity that we have. It's mm-hmm. a process that occurs in my nervous system. Now, if I look back in my life, well, why do I have trouble paying attention? And why do I tune out? Why does anybody, by the way? If you have tell me of ADHD or quote unquote have ADHD, I can tell you about your childhood. And your childhood is number one, 
you're probably genetically very sensitive, which means you're more affected by things than other kids are. You had a very stressful early few early years. Your parents had difficulties. They maybe did their best. They loved you, but they had their own stresses. You as a sensitive child absorb those stresses. You can't help it. That's your nature. How does a young infant, small child deal with stresses? Can they escape or change the situation? Their, no. brains, their brains tune out as a defense mechanism. Right. So, so it becomes as a cope, it begins as a coping mechanism. But when does it begin as a coping mechanism? When your brain is being developed. So it gets programmed into your brain. But that's you're mean. talking about, you know, the encoding that, you know, goes into your implicit memory for years on end until we try to rewire our brains. I'm talking about that. I'm talking even more than that. I'm talking about the fact that the human brain and this isn't something that I make up. This is according to brain science, and we've known this since the 1980s, that the human brain develops an interaction with the environment so that the circuits of the brain, like, do you have children? I do. I actually have a one-year-old, and I have two stepsons, 9 and 11. Okay, great. So you have a one-year-old. I do. And every time I was reading your book, I'm like, oh, my God, I'm doing this wrong. I can't break eye contact with her. <laughs> Well, exactly. But here's the thing. No one-day-old baby has any attention skills. They can pay attention only for a few seconds. Right. You know? They don't have impulse regulation. They can't even control their bladder, you know? Now, bladder control has to develop with the development of the nervous system. Right. So does impulse control have to develop with the development of the nervous system? So... The question is, if it's a matter of development, then the question you have to ask is, what are the right conditions for healthy brain development and what are not? So with your kind permission, I'll read two sentences. Please do. Yeah. Okay. This is from an article that appeared in the journal of pediatrics. This is the official organization of American pediatricians. And the article is from the Harvard Center on the Developing Child. Now, this the Harvard Center is the world's foremost child brain development study organization. And in this article published 11 years ago now, 15 years after the publication of my book, when I was already mm -hmm. saying these things, not, not because I discovered it, but because the research was already available, right. they, they summed up the research. And here's what they say about brain development. The architecture of the brain is constructed to an ongoing process that begins before birth, continues into adulthood, and establishes either a sturdy or fragile foundation for all the health, learning, and behavior that follow. Now, the architecture of the brain is constructed to an ongoing process that begins before birth. What does that mean? It means that the emotional states of the mother are already shaping the circuit of the infant brain. Mothers who are stressed during pregnancy are much more likely to have kids with ADHD later on. We know that, okay? Secondly, it establishes either a sturdy or fragile foundation for all the health, learning, and behavior. Not some of the health, all the health. So the foundation of health, learning, and behavior are laid down to the construction of the brain, which begins before birth. Now, if you want to know why adopted kids have much more higher risk of, uh, of ADHD? It's yes. Because they, because they suffer. First of all, they spend nine months in a stressed uterus because any woman who's going to give up a baby for adoption is by definition stressed. If she wasn't stressed, she wouldn't want to give up her infant. Right. She's a single mom, she's an addicted mom, she's an abused mom, a poor mom, uh, an immature teenage mom. So for nine months, the hormones of stress are going through to the baby, affecting their brain development. Right. And then at, at birth happens the major trauma, which is separation from the body of the birth mother, which is a trauma to the infant. So that's the first sentence, okay? This is key. The interactions of genes and experiences literally shapes the circuitry of the developing brain. So it's not genes. It's the action of the environment on the genes that turns the genes on and off. So the interactions of genes and experiences literally shapes the circuitry of the developing brain and is critically influenced by the mutual responsiveness of adult child relationships, particularly in the early childhood years, which means that the most important influence on the physiology, on the neurotransmitters, on the connection, synapses, and networks of the brain is the quality of emotional interaction. 
with yeah. the adults. Now, if the adults are stressed, now, why are more and more kids being diagnosed these days? Because parents are more and more stressed than they used to be. It's not the fault of the parents. There's no parent blaming here. But the stress is on the parents. Actually, Absolutely. in fact, in the more genetically sensitive the child, the more likely they're going to be affected. So when somebody tells me they've got ADHD, okay, okay, I know. First of all, you're a very sensitive person. B, you grew up in a stressed environment. And your brain dealt with it by tuning out. And the impulse regulation and the attention circuits just didn't get the right support for their development. So it's not a disease. It's a developmental problem, which is good news because it means that if we provide the right environment to older kids or, How old? or to adults, they, okay. can develop, they can develop new circuits. And the problem with the diagnosis is that first it doesn't explain anything. It just describes it, as I already said. Number one, number two. Most of the time people get diagnosed, whether it's a child or an adult, all that happens is that somebody tries to deal with their symptoms, but not with the underlying issue. Right. And that's why people struggle. Because most physicians, by the way, would never clue what I'm talking about. Because this stuff about brain development is not taught in the medical schools, even though it appears in all the medical journals. It's unbelievable. The gap between science and medical practice. Why do you think that there is that big gap? They're, they're just not studying it in school? Before I answer that, can I ask you, am I making sense to you? You are making sense to me. Actually, ironically, when I first started my ADHD journey, I was talking to a neuroscientist who told me something similar to what you're sharing with me. And she was explaining how RNA can change over time based on environmental yeah. issues and that's what she thought was the development of ADHD. So when they talk about it running in families, the, the fact that it runs in families proves nothing about genetics. I mean, I'm a medical doctor. If if my three kids... They all have it, right? Two of them have been diagnosed with it. But that doesn't mean I pass it on genetically um, because if they became medical doctors, would that prove that the practice of medicine is a genetic disease? Something can run in families without being passed on genetically. What is passed on is the stress. Mm, so do you think that's where the confusion is then? So the stress that the parent has gotten and it's encoded into their brain, now it's being passed on to the children. Of course it is. When my kids were small, I was a workaholic, driven, somewhat depressed, functioning very much like the typical ADHD person. At home, I would be kind of listless and bored and I wouldn't be that engaged. Yeah. And I was, in, I was in a stressed marriage because we always marry somebody at the same level of trauma and stress that we're at. So my wife and I, together in our 53 and a half years, but when we had children, it was a very stressed marriage. And our kids would live in a stressed environment. We didn't pass on the ADHD, we passed on the stress. And, and and their response to that is to tune out. You know, that's right. just, you know, so the fact that something runs in, you know, they say alcoholism is a genetic. No, it isn't. There are no alcoholism genes. And anytime they think they've found one, turns out they didn't. But what's it like to grow up in a home when there's, where their father is an alcoholic? It's traumatic. Sure. And what is alcohol? It's a painkiller. So you start drinking to soothe your pain. By the way, people with ADHD, as we know, are more... Are tended to addiction, right? What is it, 50%? I don't know, but it's certainly higher than the average. And and why? Because both addictions and ADHD start off in early childhood stress and trauma. Yeah. Like there's an article in the New York Times on Sunday about how, for some unknown reason, whether you treat kids with ADHD with medications or whether you don't, the risk of addiction is the same. Right. And I'm and, so glad and, that you said that. And they said, for reasons we don't understand. Well, that's because they don't see reality. The reality mm. is both ADHD and addictions are rooted in emotional pain, stress, and trauma. So, so, so if you treat kids with medications, but you don't address their emotional needs, well, of they course, they're, they're, why, why would they be less at risk for addiction than other people? If the ADHD medication is increasing the flow of dopamine, yeah, which ADHDers lack, we know. Yeah, no, we don't actually. 
Well, we're not getting it at a stable rate, correct? No? We don't know anything. <laughs> right, because we can't operate on a human well, here's, the, well, here's the thing. The medications can help, right? I mean, I've experienced that. Mm -hmm. Maybe you've experienced it. Mm -hmm. uh, antidepressants can help. I've correct, experienced yeah. that. I've right. experienced that. But does that mean that the problem was a lack of that chemical in your brain? Let me I, I ask you a question. If you go to a party and you feel kind of shy and reticent, and then you have a glass of whiskey and all of a sudden you're friendly and more open-hearted, open-minded, does that mean that your social shyness was caused by a lack of whiskey in your brain? Of course not. Okay, well then let's not jump from medication to conclusions about causation. Absolutely. And I'm just asking though, if someone does take ADHD medication, right? Very yeah. often it's been shared that they can stop binge eating as much while they're on the medication. They have less addictive behaviors. So do you disagree with that? Because you just said that the you know, the times came out that it doesn't really make a change on addictive tendencies. Well, when I took Dexedine, literally I became more of a workaholic. Yeah. So it just is displayed yeah. somewhere else. I could pay attention better and stay longer at the task. Help me write the first book, as I mentioned. I'm grateful for it. But it didn't help my addictive tendency one little bit. You know, mm. that was a whole other issue. Right. You know? No. The work callism was in response to my childhood trauma. Right. So unless you deal with that stress, traumatic basis. So the thing with, if you have an ADHD child, don't just try and fix their behaviors. The medications may help, or they may not. You know, I'm not against them. I prescribe them. I use them. But they're not the answer. They only deal with symptoms. Sure. So with the workaholism, as you mentioned also in your book, you talk about contingent self-esteem and true yeah. self-esteem. Would you yeah. say that your workaholism was giving you that reward and that was contingent self-esteem? Yes. So contingent self-esteem means that your self-esteem hinges on something else. Maybe you like me. That makes me feel really good about myself. But if you didn't like me, that makes me feel bad about myself. That means that my self-esteem is contingent on your opinion. Right. Or maybe my self-esteem is contingent on my being successful at work. Right. Maybe my self-esteem depends on how people appreciate my looks or whether I write a best-selling book or not. Well, that's contingent self-esteem. Contingent right. self-esteem says I'm worthwhile because I can do this, that, or the other. But genuine self-esteem has got nothing to do with that. Genuine self-esteem says... I'm worthwhile whether or not I can do this, that, or the other. And people with ADHD tend to, well, a lot of people in our society, uh, as I talk about in my most recent book, a lot of people in the society are trained to have this contingent self-esteem where how I feel about myself depends on what I can achieve, attain, or acquire. Other people's um, esteem, financial success, but that's not genuine self-esteem. Genuine self-esteem says, self says you're worthwhile as a human being just because you exist, period. Right. That's, and and that very few of us get because to get that, you have to have parents who are really able to validate and accept you exactly the way you are. And most yeah. of us as parents struggle, as much as we love our kids, <laughs> most of us struggle to give them that sense of unconditional acceptance. Yeah, there's so many questions um, that I want to ask about parenting. Of course, as a new mom of a 13-month-old, you had mentioned in the book that rewards don't work as far as you know homework and you know anything that the parent specifically wants and the child is not motivated on and also punishment doesn't work for a long-term well goals. no they work but they may or may not work but to what effect so look if you want to get a two-year-old to behave i want to be extreme here and don't get triggered anybody if you can help it if you want a kid to behave hit him really hard a few times it works it, it yeah, my husband was hit. Yeah, I know. 
Yeah, yeah. but then there's the, all that trauma and emotional. Yeah. So yeah, tuning out. No, if you want to reward a kid, if you no, Alfie Cohen was an educator. He says, "Do rewards motivate kids? Yes, it motivates them to get more rewards." Yeah, but, right. I, but but is that what we want, or do we want to have it? Kids have intrinsic motivation, where they want to learn. Intrinsic motivation all the time. And that's what we want. So with rewards, we undermine the intrinsic motivation. Now, what if your husband said to you? Every time you tell me that you love me, Brooke, I'm going to give you $10. Okay? I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> All day long. Yeah. <laughs> Every minute. <laughs> yeah. And after a while, you wouldn't do it anymore. You're right. Because you're not saying because it comes out of you. You're saying it to get a reward. In That's fact, so powerful. Because, and since it's not coming from you, you will even start resisting it. You know, this business of... Okay, if you're good today, I'll give you a chocolate bar. And if you're good for, f if after you've earned five chocolate bars, <laughs> I'll take a movie. And after five movies, I'll take you to the mall. And after five malls, I'll take you to Disneyland. And after five Disneyland. Hey, my, my two stepsons are very rich right now. <laughs> no, just kidding. They spend all their money on Roblox. <laughs> okay. What's going to happen is that a part of you will start resisting it because this coercion in it. Every time you want somebody to do something more than they want to do it, it's a kind of pressure. So the reward itself is the kind of pressure. Gotcha. And, and lots of experiences have shown that when you stop the pay, they stop the play. In other words, they do it for the reward, but as soon they as- They pay to stop, play. Yeah. So you want kids to be motivated intrinsically. So of course, the I'm sure you've heard this a million times, if they're not intrinsically motivated and you're showing them lots of love and emotional connection and you're truly engaged, yeah. then what? Then they start feeling good about themselves and they'll be intrinsically motivated. Intrinsic motivation comes from I'm worthwhile, I'm uninteresting, and, and, and my thoughts and desires matter. And that gives you intrinsic motivation. First of all, you have a 13-month-old? Yes. How much do you have to motivate them? Not very much. I mean, he, she? She, Brielle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Brielle will want to eat. She'll want to play. She wants to play. Let us know. <laughs> she wants to play peekaboo. You know, she wants to pet the cat or the dog. You know, she's absolutely. She's nothing but intrinsic motivation. Why You're right. We, why do we ruin it? You know? That that's part of our nature. Intrinsic motivation. I mean, any animal has intrinsic motivation. Do you have to motivate a lion out in the woods to live? Or do you have, do you have to motivate a bear cub? I mean, nope. motiv in, intrinsic motivation is part of nature. It's part of our nature. Problem is that the way we parent, we kill it, and then we try to motivate them with rewards or punishments. So, do you believe that? As a former special education teacher and administrator, yeah. we would do behavior plans for uh, students with ADHD because it got them to focus on the curriculum and they would receive rewards. So would you say cut those out? I, I know it's not a black and white thing, but do they not work long term? No, they don't work long term. Um, you, you cannot teach intrinsic motivation by external rewards. You know, the real question is, why did they have trouble paying attention? Right. What kind, what kind of stress is going on in their homes? How they, getting down to the core. You know, how do they feel about themselves? You know, what do they need to feel good about themselves? What do they need to feel validated? You know, now, absolutely. having said that, I'm not being absolute here, but I'm saying if we only focus on behaviors, we're missing the point. The behaviors in any human being, children especially, or only a manifestation of their internal emotional lives. Yeah. And and by the way, I used to be a teacher as well. N n nothing in my education ever taught me anything about the emotional lives of children. Did you get any such education? No. No. And yet that's the most important dynamic. Someone asked me this recently on their podcast. What is something you remember that really stood out to you? A negative comment and a positive comment. And I said, the negative comment was from my fourth grade teacher. The positive comment was from my fifth grade teacher. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I remember that too. We all remember. <laughs> they're, they're so powerful, you know, and, and uh, I only taught for three years, but so I didn't have that many students, you know, but oh, every once in a while, I run into, I run, run into some middle-aged adult, <laughs> which makes you feel really old, and, and they say, you don't remember this, but I used to be my teacher, and you said one thing to me that's always stayed with me. You know? Amazing. You know, and Amazing. On the other hand, when I was in family practice and I began to receive um, referrals to treat people for ADHD, I'd have adults in their 30s, 40s, sitting in my office, crying tears because something a teacher said to me when they were 12 years old in a classroom. Some well meaning teacher who didn't know what they were talking about, who said, the classroom will resume and Johnny comes back to earth. Yeah. Something, you know, and that, that person carried that wound for decades. A hundred percent. I just heard from um, my nine-year-old's mom that the teacher excluded him from an activity because he wasn't able to follow all the directions. Yeah. He has ADHD, he's working memory. I mean, he does. He can't follow the directions to a T. He right, so now he's sitting it. while everyone else is doing the activity. How embarrassing. It's humiliating is what it yeah, is. Yeah, it is, it is. And it, and it, and it, gives, and it traumatizes the kid. It, it gives him the sense that he has something wrong with him, he doesn't belong. He's a failure, absolutely. The, the teachers have no idea how much power they wield and how much damage they inadvertently do. Yeah. That kid you're talking about is difficulty following multiple directions. I have difficulty following multiple directions. So do I. <laughs> but then to make a kid wrong for it. Oh, yeah. It's actually, a, I mean, it's actually a, f a function of their brain circuitry. You know? It's terrible. Yeah, and a lot of kids are being humiliated and hurt in our schools that way. Because the schools don't pay attention to the child's internal life, just to their external function. Yeah. Outside of this book, I've heard a lot of your talks before about compounded trauma and like trauma. That yeah. is one event. Yeah. Can you give an example? Because compounded trauma could be very, like to someone, it might seem like nothing, right? But it's still considered trauma to the individual. So can you describe the difference between compounded trauma and trauma? I'm not sure that I use the phrase compounded trauma myself. Actually. Okay. The underlying principle of what you're raising here is important. You can't define trauma for somebody else. You know, for example, if I say to a child, don't be so stupid. If that child feels good about themselves, they can go to mommy and daddy and say, hey, Gabor said I'm stupid and I don't like it. And they say, Oh, don't be ridiculous. He doesn't know what he's talking about. That kid's not going to be traumatized. But if that kid already feels bad about themselves, then I'm just confirming what they already believe. Yeah. So it's the same incident, completely different impact. Depending and, on the person differently. And depending also on the sensitivity of the child. The more sensitive, the more likely they are to be hurt. Now, uh, trauma simply means a wound. That's what it means. Wounds can be small or great. But what is a deep wound, a painful wound for me, might not be for you and vice versa. It never does to say to anybody, oh, come on, it can't be that bad. You know, like, look, if, if, you, if you're 13 month old, when she's three years old, said, mommy, I'm hungry, I wanna eat. And, and you said, well, dinner is in 10 minutes. No, I wanna eat right now. And if you said, well, think about all the starving children in Asia. <laughs> That's invalidating her thoughts. How helpful would that? It may be true, but it's how not helpful. helpful. Yeah, so it doesn't doesn't do to compare people's traumas, or yeah. people's experiences. You know, people can be wounded in many ways. They can be wounded by terrible things happening: a tsunami, a war, an earthquake, a parent dying, a parent being abusive, physically, emotionally, sexually, a, a, a bad divorce. Violence. You were a Holocaust survivor, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah as an infant. But you, but you don't need those terrible big T events to traumatize people. And in, in my new book, The Myth of Normal, and it's the first chapter is about trauma. Can't wait to you read also, that. You can also wound kids just by not meeting their needs. Mm. So, for example, again, let's take you and I as adults. They're both married. How does it feel when our partner misunderstands or misrepresents what we said? What does it feel like? 
It feels like a punch in the gut. Okay. Now here we are an adult. Here I am an adult. We have much more capacity. How does it feel to a two-year-old not to be understood? It must be like their world is over. Yeah. And to the adult, it's nothing. You know, I'm going to say the adult was doing it. They don't even realize they're doing it. But just by not getting the kid, not being attuned with the kid, not understanding the kid, especially this happens, I mean, I mean, occasionally it happens, but if it happens regularly, for example, if a kid is very sensitive and they're yeah. constantly being told, don't be so sensitive. Oh, that's the worst. You're, they, you're saying, don't be you. Right. You know, it's, it's right. like me telling you not to be a brunette. It's right. If somebody's sensitive, that's how they are. When they're told, don't be so sensitive, what are they really hearing? With we don't like you the way that you yeah. are. You're not acceptable the way you are. That's yeah. deep wounding. That's deeply wounding to adults, let alone to young children. Right. And kids are wounded in these days, in these ways, all the time. But adults who love them, who are doing I know, their it's best. It's so sad. And and exactly, we're doing our best. We're not realizing it's happening. And there's so many things to think about. As I like I said, as I was reading Scatter Minds, I was thinking to myself, Oh my God. I need to make sure I do this or don't do this. So yes. when you had mentioned the eye contact, don't break eye contact with an infant. Yeah. Now I'm just staring at her until she does. <laughs> yeah. And and when she does, let her. Yeah. Don't, hey, don't try and don't Look try. at me, focus, right? No. Exactly. No. It's not about you. It's about her. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about um, timeouts? I know I had just seen another um, podcast that you were on where you mentioned timeouts. Okay. Let's say you're with your present spouse, and on the first day they say to you, well, um, you know, I really do find you quite attractive and interesting, and I'd love to know where you get to better, but one thing I've got to tell you, if you displease me, you're going to have to go to a different room. How long would you stay in that relationship? <laughs> I would take myself to the other room. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the thing. The attachment relationship for young children is absolutely essential, not just for survival, but for healthy development. That's true not only for human beings, but for all mammals. Mammals develop mother bears, know how to cuddle their babies, mother cats, mother rats, Mother elephants, dolphins, whales, wolves, you know, the attachment relationship is essential for healthy child development, for healthy brain development, without which the child is very anxious. Okay? Now, that's the first point, the importance of the attachment relationship. The second point to realize is that kids can only attach physically. Like, if you and your spouse couldn't see each other for a week, you might not like it, but it will not be the end of the world because you can still love each other and hold each other in your memory and in your hearts. Your infant can't do that. Your young child can't do that. They can only attach physically. They have to hear you, see you, smell you, touch you to attach with you. When you say to them, if you displease me, you're away from me. You're saying to them, I'm using against you the biggest fear that you have, which is the loss of me. And I'm using that to get you to comply with my expectations. So I'm going to threaten you with your worst nightmare. That's so what do we do? Do we leave the room then if they're misbehaving? Why would anybody have to leave the room? First of all, misbehaving is an adult concept. Right. It's them doing what we want them to do. Yeah, or not doing what we want to do. So the, the child is just doing what they're doing. So let's say a two-year-old throws a tantrum. And by the way, when do we throw tantrums? I mean, I don't know. I can tell you when I throw a tantrum. When we're hungry, tired. Yeah, yeah. All that. Yeah. When we're frustrated about something. Mm -hmm. So if you're a good mother, you're going to frustrate your child. Because Bria will come to you before dinner and says, Mom, I want a cookie. And you're going to say no cookie before dinner. If you're doing your job. I want a cookie. No, I said no cookie. And then she throws a tantrum. But why shouldn't she? You've just frustrated her. A tantrum is a normal response to frustration. Yeah. But why should she have to leave the room? Because she gets because her nervous system gets in a frustrated state, you know? <laughs> what you say to her is, boy, you're really upset that mommy won't give you a cookie. Yeah. You really wish you could have a cookie before dinner. Yeah. You pick him up and you hold him and say, oh, boy, it's hard to wait sometimes when we want something, isn't it? You know? That's how you deal with it. So we identify what they're upset about. 
you don't, you don't, it's not, we're not talking about permissive parenting. We're not indulging them. We're not going to give them the cookie, but we're certainly not them making wrong for being upset about it. Right. It's you know? kind of. No. no. If a kid is, is exhibiting more destructive behavior, like breaking plates or hitting their siblings, well, there's the issue of, well, what's frustrating them so much? Because right. all aggression comes out of frustration. Right. When, when do we get frustrated? When our needs aren't met. Right. So that child is deeply frustrated about something. And our job is to figure out, in the short yes. term, that doesn't mean I allow them to hit their siblings. No hitting your siblings. You must be very upset right now. Come here. Yeah, that oppositional defiance is uh, learned behavior, and that's really hard for people to un like, actually take in. It's not even learned. It's what is some, it? It's something else. First of all, this idea of oppositional defiant disorder is the stupidest diagnosis in the universe. It doesn't even exist. Oh. No. Not, not only does it not exist, even theoretically it can't exist. Because let me ask you a question. If my foot was broken right now, if I had a broken foot, would it have been any less broken because I'm talking to you? No. But if I wasn't talking to you, could I oppose you? No. In other words, oppositionality depends on a relationship. It's not a disorder in the individual. It's a dynamic in the relationship. Why are we diagnosing the kid instead of looking at the relationship? Yeah. That's the first point. Second point is, who are these kids that behave in those ways? I can tell you two things about them. Number one, the better our relationship was, the less likely you are to oppose me. If you really trusted me and in my guidance, and if I suggested something, you're much more likely to go along with it. Oh, yes. Than if you didn't trust me. Well, these kids who are oppositional, they've lost their trust in the adult world. And that's not their fault. That's the function of this culture that makes it so difficult for, for kids to stay connected to their adults. That's the first point. The second point is, um, you can try this experiment with your hands. Just put up your two hands like this. Now take it, put them together, and take your right hand, as push as hard as you can with your right hand. And what does the left hand do? It stays. It pushes it, back. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's not being right. No, yeah. So. That's what in this book we call counter will. Counter will is the automatic resistance to any sense of coercion. So these kids that we call oppositional defiant, they don't have a disorder. What, what it is, they've lost their trust in the adult world and they've been pushed on too much. Now they push back. Now if I change the relationship, guess what? Their oppositionality disappears, it evaporates. So why are we diagnosing the kid? It's utter nonsense yeah because our we can rewire our brain what would you say i don't even know if it can happen and i would love your thoughts on emdr but if someone has a troubled childhood and their implicit memory is encoded in their brain yeah can we remove that implicit memory over time or not be affected by it? It's the, it's the latter, you know? In this book, The Myth of Normal, which I'll go to the trouble, not the trouble, I'll go to the self-serving exercise of showing to you. Okay. Yes, please, I can't wait to read it. Myth, myth of Normal. In the first chapter, I talk about an incident of me arriving from a speaking trip in the States, back to Canada and to Vancouver. And my wife, Ray, this is like when I was young and stupid seven years ago. And and my wife said... Uh, That's uh, the one thing I love about you. you. You're not saying this all or nothing thing. And you really are so humble in this book. You know, you yeah. you share that you've been through it all. Everything that you're explaining, you've experienced and no one's perfect. Well, not only did I, I still am, you know. So it's, it's, it's an ongoing thing, you know. So I arrived back from this speaking trip and Ray, my wife who's an artist, said that she picked me up at the airport. And I'm feeling really good. It was a good speaking trip and a nice flight. And I arrive at the airport and she texts me saying, I haven't left home yet. Do you still want me to come? And I text back saying, never mind. And I take a taxi home and I come in the house and I won't even look at her. Because she abandoned you in your mind, right? In my mind, yes. Yeah. 
fact that she didn't abandon me, she's just a painter. And I've only known this for five decades. And so she, and when she's in the studio, you know what? The whole world disappears. That's the way of the artist. But in my implicit memory, as you say, there's a memory of my mother abandoning me. That's already an interpretation. She didn't actually abandon me. She gave me to a stranger in January or in December 1944 when I was 11 months old to save my life under the Nazi occupation. However, as an infant, how do I experience being given to a stranger as a... She doesn't a, want you. She, I, she doesn't want me. And I'm being abandoned. That implicit memory of that, then Ray doesn't show up at the airport. And clearly I hadn't worked out the wound by then yet. Oh boy, I'm being abandoned. And no, when I did see my mother five weeks later, I didn't even look at her for several days, she told me. And which is what an infant does to protect themselves. The infant's brain says, you were so hurt when you abandoned, you will not make yourself so vulnerable again. So that means in our relationship, when we have a bit of a fight or I'm disappointed, my tendency is to withdraw. Same. You yeah. dissociate and withdraw. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's my automatic tendency. That's what I did in this case. Now, that was seven years ago. I worked it through. <laughs> How? That's the golden question. <laughs> First of all, by recognizing that my reaction is not to the present, but to the past. So these days, when I have an intense reaction, I know it's not about the present. Most of the time. I mean, yeah. if somebody accosted me with a gun, I'd have a strong reaction in the present. <laughs> yes, you would. <laughs> but, but most of the time, when they have these intense flight or fight defensive reactions, I know it's just my nervous system acting, and then I give myself time to actually process it, you know? And uh, so Do you remove yourself from the situation, take time to breathe, not confront the other person until you process it? That would be a very healthy time out when you say, I need to settle myself, ground myself, whatever I use, whether it's deep breathing or meditation or going for a walk in nature or listen to a piece of music or whatever it is, but I need to ground myself. That's a good time out. I'm not timing out to punish you. It's a time out to get myself grounded. That's a healthy time out. You know? I love that. So that's one thing. The other thing, of course, is that for the ADHD adult, they may think they have this fixed disease, but actually the more stressed their lives is, the more difficult they are paying attention. So ask yourself, how are you creating stress for yourself? Are you taking on too much? Typically the answer is yes. <laughs> Absolutely. So I've written a book, um, came out 20 years ago now, called When the Body Says No. And it's about chronic illness, like autoimmune disease and so on. And what I'm saying is that when you don't know how to say no, when you take on too much, or the, the world's expectations, other people's demands, your body will say no in the form of illness. These are typically the people with autoimmune disease. Uh, oh yeah, my sister. Multiple sclerosis. She got to read when the body says no. or the Absolutely. Because she was getting psoriasis. Um, it was her body from internal accident. She tried everything. Every doctor said she has Lyme disease. Not, she doesn't have Lyme disease. Yeah. What she has is a personality that suppresses her own needs, automatically takes care of others. Yeah, she's a people pleaser. She's probably way too nice for her own good. She doesn't know yep. how to get angry in a healthy way. She probably believes that she's responsible for other people feel, and she must never disappoint anybody, and that's why she's got autoimmune disease. A hundred percent. It's not her fault. It's how she was programmed as a child. It's, she, it's how she survived her childhood. Not her fault, but she can turn it around. But anyway, the point is, my wife said to me five years ago, buddy, you've written a book called When the Body Says No, no, you better write one called when the wife says no. Oh, <laughs> I like that. Because <laughs> I'm not putting up with this work all. She's sassy. I like her. <laughs> well, she's savvy and she's sassy. And she, yeah. calls and she calls me on my stuff, you know. But when I do stress myself, when I do take on too much, guess what? Your body my reacts. Brain and, and my brain and my mind react. Literally, the first thing when a client usually comes to me in coaching with ADHD, they're like, I just don't know how to manage my schedule. I can't get X, Y, and Z done. I'm like, all right, so tell me what's on your schedule. Well, yeah. I'm going to write a book this week. I'm going to write a screenplay. I'm right. going to yeah. compose, compose, compose a symphony. <laughs> exactly. 
and mm-hmm. and it's so common that's what i'm hearing and it it all goes to me from what i've read in you know your book it's that self-esteem that comes from the contingent uh, self-esteem and once they are aware and they identify with themselves and they feel more confident and they realize there's other people like them i I went through that when i was writing this book the myth of normal i worked on it for 10 years and two years ago when i was working on it i started panicking because i collected twenty five thousand articles and and filed them and read all these books and all these interviews and the writing wasn't going well, and I started panicking. And uh, my blood pressure started going up. Mm. And this is me, who is very healthy, basically. And I did something desperate. I decided to talk to a therapist, you know? <laughs> now, That's the, great. Uh, and I know it is. I'm just joking because yeah. I'm the one Because you are. <laughs> I'm, I'm the one that's supposed to know everything, you know? And, and yeah. I'm, Helps yeah. all these others. Therapists need therapists. Coaches need uh, coaches. In response to what you said about your client who wants to write the book and so on, I realized what was upsetting me wasn't the book. It was my relationship to it. I had this implicit idea that if this book fails, then I'm a failure. And you're a failure. Now, once I made that separation, I'll write this book. If it succeeds, great. If it doesn't, that's life. I was in no panic anymore. So same with your client. Yes. It's not. It's not. How do I complete the book, write the symphony, and the screenplay? It's right. why do I believe I have to do all that? Right, and it's so interesting um, the connection to when you put so much pressure on yourself and you and you believe that you are a failure if you don't finish it, then your your executive function shuts down because of the emotional piece, the emotional dysregulation. So you you exactly. literally will not finish it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Uh, so what would you say, um, some closing thoughts you would recommend for someone struggling who identifies as having ADHD for a success tip? Yeah, well, first recognize that there's nothing wrong with you, that your symptoms related to ADHD are normal responses to abnormal circumstances, number one. Number two, you cannot recreate your childhood but you can treat yourself better as an adult and look at the stresses in your life. How well are you taking care of yourself? Are you eating well? Are you looking after your body? Do you get exercise? Do you give your mind a break? Do you connect with nature? Do you deal with your stresses when you're upset? Are you able to ask for help and talk to somebody? You're not isolated. You don't have to be alone with this. You can actually get help. It's so hard for us to ask for help. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and so ask for help. And, yeah. and so th- there's a lot we can do. To The good news about the human brain, it's got what's called neuroplasticity. You can develop new circuits even later on in life. But it takes some work, you know. It's if you want to if you want to branch past 300 pounds, you don't- Doesn't make, happen tomorrow. <laughs> you're not gonna, you don't do it by lift, trying to lift 300 pounds. You, you know, you, you, you start by lifting the bar Yes. And, 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 and so you have to commit to yourself. If you're important enough, you'll put in the work. And don't just rely on some medication to fix you. The medication may or may not help your symptom. It may or may not cause side effects. If it helps without side effects, terrific. Congratulations. Take it when you need it. But it's not going to change who you are. They won't teach skills 100%. No. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. And if people want to find you, where can they find you? It's impossible not to find me. <laughs> they're prepared. The, they're, they're, yeah, uh, you just Google just Gabor Google. and Google. your name pops up. Oh, Gabor Mate. There's a website, drgabormate.com. Um, you can join my Instagram account if you wish. Sign up for an email list if you want. Dozens of my talks on YouTube, enough to join anything or pay anything. There's my five books, which I won't run through. But by the way, I am going to recommend for you and any kids with young, any parents with young kids that they read Hold On To Your Kids, which is not my work. But in this book, Scattered Minds, you may recall the name Gordon Neufeld. He's a psychologist who I quoted on this oppositionality. Well, Hold On To Your Kids is his work that I helped him write. It's really an important parenting book. It's about, it's about the importance of maintaining the attachment relationship with your child so the child doesn't get swallowed up in the peer group and the peer culture. Mm. 
So that's called Hold On To Your Kids. And I'll put those links in the show notes too so people can access that. Sure. Thank you so much for your time. I know how valuable it is. And you really um, went into deep detail of ADHD, the brain, parenting. Um, So I appreciate you. I appreciate your time. And thank you for helping our community and being unsuccessful with ADHD. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Thanks for listening to this episode of Successful with ADHD. I hope it helps you on your journey. And if you need any additional support for you or a loved one with ADHD, feel free to reach out to us at coachingwithbrooke.com and all social media platforms at Coaching with Brooke. And remember, it's Brooke with an E. Thanks again for listening. See you next time.